So now we come to the second session of today's event. Uh, it will be on our best practice in doing a global investor best. Our second guest speaker has a 16-year career in banking with Dutch Bank, Bering Barters, and Goldman Sachs. And she once worked as the CEO of a listed company on AIM in the UK. She's now a senior partner at Tomcon Asia, which is a specialist in corporate and financial communications. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Ms. Ms. Angela Kadoe Noor. I'm actually going to sit down because I don't want to like straining my neck and not uh, not be able to hear. Also, I'd probably be able to click this thing better from here. So you can use the microphone. Is this working? Is this Yeah. Okay. Firstly, thank you very, very much to SCT for inviting me today, and thank you for all of you for coming on a Friday afternoon. I'm sure. The weekend is not far away, and I shall try and be brief and interesting to keep you all awake. So, fantastic. So, I think um, mainly uh, my um, concern will cover my introduction, but hmm, let me see. This is me. As a, as a brief introduction, I've done 16 years in investment banking, mainly on the M&A and advisory side. Most of the time at Goldman and Deutsche, and I worked in London and New York and Sydney and amongst other places for my sins. Um, four years as a chief executive of a listed business, so I have I'd be on your side of the table. Um, I did three acquisitions and two fundraisings during that time, so I know how difficult it is to get noticed and raise money. Um, and in 2010, I established Tonkin in Asia. Tonkin in Asia, the genesis of the business was to bring international best practice, particularly in financial and uh, capital markets communications, to Southeast Asian companies. We are based in Singapore, we're a team of 10 people, um, with the, the mission to ensure that um, we can share our experiences and, uh, and help advise clients on internal and external stakeholder engagement, particularly as it relates to, to capital markets uh, communications. You can see a list of our clients um, on the side, and as Harold referred to Sea Games, WhatsApp is one of our clients, which is where the Sea Games will be held in a few weeks' time. So that is the end of the, the um, adverts for Tolkien. Um, I really wanted to build on what, uh, what um, Harold was saying about how competition for capital is intense and to Justin's point that um, you are not just competing with the, 600, the 506 companies on SCT, but you are competing with the, co the companies, uh, 9,300 9, companies listed on the eight key regional exchanges. And this is what the this is what the challenge is. The challenge is how do you stand out to compete for investor attention? Trading securities is now very fungible. As Justin said, people will trade across currencies, time zones. You know, these are your competition, not just the people sitting in this room. So the, the most important need is is to is the need for timely, transparent, and consistent communication. Um, and what we will talk about specifically today is you know, who you should be communicating with and how you can understand what the investors' investment criteria and needs really are. So targeting investors, why would you do that? I mean, I think the, the, the most obvious point to make here is that because it will save you time and it will save you money. Um, if you know, if you, if, you know, it will help you develop a, develop a focused approach to what is otherwise a very, very complicated jigsaw. You know, it can also help refresh your investor base over the longer term, and it can help generate broad and stable shareholder base should those be your objectives. But the most important reason is to make sure that you are targeting the right people with the right messages. And that is common sense, but very rarely gets done or doesn't get done not very well by a lot of companies. It tends to be a, a, 
the starting point for most companies is if I if I talk to anyone and scatter as wide as I possibly can, then you know I'm sure I'll find somebody who is interested. And and really, you know, that is exactly the approach that, that I would would advise against. It is not about a scattergun approach. You are not going to appeal to everyone. It's about finding that you know, making sure that you are developing a targeted campaign so that you save yourselves time and your, and your management team's time in, in focusing correctly. So knowing your investors, again, you know, it seems like such a basic starting point, but who owns my shares? But you know, again, it, it's it's. Uh, it's, it's interesting how few companies really do understand exactly who owns their shares. And, and uh, unless you have that information, it's very difficult to build a value-added investor relations program. Um, on it. You need that as a foundation. You know, so who owns my shares is, is, is a very, very key building block if any investor relations program. Who are my investors? Um, you know, one of the difficulties with who are, who are my investors is that the investors that you really want to understand are the institutional investors, and they often hide behind nominees and other, other sort of opaque um, uh, vehicles, and it can be very difficult to actually dig down and understand exactly who they are and, 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 and on to the next question, why do they invest? Again, you know, it's very important for shareholders to understand why company, why shareholders invest in them, because then they understand what the drivers are and therefore what their vulnerabilities are. I mean, if you have a whole load of value investors in your in your stock, you need to know about that because when your stock starts to move out of the value range, you need to know that you're vulnerable and your share price may fall because a lot of the value investors are going to be running for the door, and you need to be then building your 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 investors in the other categories. So it's, a, it's a very important to understand you know, why, what are their motivations um, and which investors should you know, invest. Um, you know, again, you know, backing back, you know, what is your strategy? Who are you going to appeal to? You know, it's not just about getting your messages right. It's about understanding who your messages are going to appeal to and making sure that you, know, you have a strategy to, to, to deal with them. So targeting investors, you know, how do we do it? Or, and you know, there are two, there are two main ways of doing it. One is the internal kind of do-it-yourself, and the other is the external third-party uh, route. The internal do-it-yourself uh, route is is basically you, you know, you, you as investor relations officers. You know, often with the help of service providers who will help provide data, really going out and, and building a picture of what you believe you know, are your investor target universe. The, third part, the, the external third party is really you know, relying on mainly banks and corporate access departments to do it for you. And they rely on information which they have and... I mean, we could talk a little bit more about, about uh, you know, the banks and their, their varying motivations later, but um, those are effectively the two, the two means of which you can do it. When we're looking at the internal do-it-yourself, which I think is probably you know, an interesting topic for this afternoon, there are two different means of doing it, you know, the qualitative and the quantitative um, methods. So let's talk first of all about the quantitative. Now, Quantitative research is, 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 is a numbers-based research and basically use that to measure sentiment and behaviours. So the way that you do quantitative in, um, targeting is really to send out questionnaires to people, asking people why they invest, what assets are in management, and any other relevant information that you want. The difficulty with this is, A, it's difficult to get questionnaires answered, so you don't get a very good take-up. Information can be misleading. People don't always do what they say they're going to do. And you can't ever prove the facts anyway. So you are left with a, a sort of unsatisfactory um, information base, which can be incomplete and, and misleading. The other way to do it is with the qualitative method and, and really working with third-party vendors. And we have uh, Ipio, who's going to talk afterwards about 
providing information and data on which you can base your qualitative uh, research. And what the qualitative bit means is, is, is basically looking behind the, the, the actions and the, and the buying activity and, and, and helping you understand then what's driving that behaviour. So for a defined peer group, you know, what it could do, it could show you know, major investors who invest you know, in your peer group, so invest in the sector but don't necessarily invest in your stock. You know, it, can, it can look at where, the, this, where different investor bases are particularly active and it can give you a relative position of yourself against, against the peer group. As we've talked about before, what this does actually shows what they, what they actually do rather than what they say they're going to do, um, which is a, a key thing. And you can therefore identify investors based much more on, on the quality and the fit and the impact that they have in terms of their, their buying behaviour. So this intelligence is... You know, it, is, it is more perfect in, in that sense and it gives you a far better insight into the active stance um, of, of, the, of, of, of investors which, which are in your universe. Looking at the external way of doing it and using banks and the corporate access groups, um, I was actually warning the investment banking side rather than the broking side, but you know, even I can tell you that the bank's not perfect by a long stretch of imagination. They all have their own agendas, they are all paid by commission, you are not their clients, the buy side is their clients, and they will wheel you around, um, you know, in the hope of getting commissions where they can get commissions. You know, there is also the sticky issue of the hedge funds who trade a lot and who are therefore very good friends with the, with the banks, um, but who may not be you know, the best investors that you can have on your register. So I'm not, I, don't want to, I don't want to completely do down, do down the banking uh, fraternity, but I think it is important to realise that sort of being lazy, in a sense, and just sort of farming out this activity to investment banks is unlikely to reap you the rewards that you want to reap um, and is unlikely to get you where you where you really want to be because you'll be you'll be very much kind of a pawn in their game and you'll be very much operating you know to their agenda as opposed to an agenda which which you have developed or which you have believed in and which targets investors that you want to believe in and I can't even begin to tell you the number of times that we've had clients when I look at the list of, of uh, um, meetings that banks have set up you know, there is, it demonstrates how little the bank understands about the story despite the research that they, they generally have because you know, there are funds there who are investing you know, for value growth you know, all sorts of different motivations not necessarily in one, you know, one you know, way you want to be where you want to be headed so, yes, that's thanks. That's the other way of doing it. But, um, as I said, it, it, you need to be very aware of, of your role in that, in, that, uh, in that game. So, when you're doing investor uh, targeting, you know, the key points are cons uh, to consider, as we talked about, understanding the financial community. You know, the investment banks have you know, different stakeholders, um, Fund managers' reliance on the sell side is increasingly diminishing. Most of the fund managers are developing their own uh, their own internal research. So the you know the old model where the, where they would be very reliant on you know the, 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 the banks would be you know, a very important shop window for you is becoming less the case because buy side really does most of their own homework now and has their own preferences. You know, low valuation is what drives the investment. You know. Valuation is always relative and to a company's peer group and market. And strategic targeting you know, begins you know, with a company's financial profile. And there's no getting away from that. No, no, no amount of targeting or anything else is going to get you away from the valuation story. And the knowledge of the institutions is key. You know, investors have the preferences, you know, they're either growth, value, income, or whatever they may be. 
investment styles are, are, you know, the labels are insufficient. You need to understand what they're doing, what behind, what, what's behind it. The non-financial drivers, a lot of investors are now looking at, and, and we were talking over lunch with SCT about, you know, some of the ESG, non-financial reputation factors that are driving a lot of um, investment community activities now. Understand before you go and see these investors if that's one of their key primary motivators. Be aware of, you know, if you're going to see a, a shareholders who have a um, history of activism. You know, I think activism, we're starting to see it uh, increasingly in Singapore, and I think in the region we are, you know, this is a trend which is going to continue to grow. I don't think once the genie's out of the bottle, it's going to go back in. And um, so those are just some key points to consider when you are doing um, investor targeting. And I think you know, to touch on a point and a question that was raised earlier, I mean, I think one of the, the key points to remember is to, is to really rehearse and prepare before you go on these roadshows and before you go and, uh, and meet these uh, investors. Um, you know, a lot of what we do with our clients is to help them prepare material which is best in class. You are, you're only likely to have an hour you know, maximum with any of these these companies. You know, if your presentation lasts an hour and a half, you know, you are not going to be you're not going to be able to sell your company and your story. You want to keep your slides to twelve slides at a max is what I say. You can put things in the appendix, but basically, you know, the, the opportunity is for the management team to talk and sell and understand the story. And um, so making sure the materials are well done and making sure that your management team understand who they're meeting and what questions they may be asked is, is critical. You know, one of the things, again, that we do with our clients, you know, we go through very um, thorough Q&A rehearsal preparation where we file questions and management so that they go away on these roadshows and we've done their targeting, you know, feeling confident and prepared. And that makes you know, the meetings you know, so much more productive and so much more enjoyable. You know, they are busy and they don't want to be going off and trading and getting caught out in these, in these presentations. So I think you know, practicing rehearsal and preparation is absolutely key. Um, you're talking about the, the investor relations officer. You know, having a good investor relations officer is such a critical part of, of a company's communication. And you know, I, I share Harold's passion for trying to help um, help the investor relations profession grow in Asia. It's a young young profession and. Uh, like Carol, I am, I am very active in OPAS to try and share as much of my experience and uh, best practice as I can because, you know, the, the, a good investor relations officer, you know, can be the difference. You know, this is a company's management teams work, work very hard to um, put the results and do, make sure the corporate story is right and MA and all the rest of it. But the truth is, that a company's story today won't sell itself. You know, you need to have a good investor relations officer and a good investor relations team who is committed to timely, transparent and consistent communication, who gets back and answers questions, who's knowledgeable. You know, again, the, the number of times that you can call an investor relations company, an uh, investor relations officer in a company, and they say, well, I'll have to get back to you. You know, that is not the right answer. You know, once you, once you, once an investor relations officer has to refer it to the CEO or whoever, you know, as an investor, I'm never going to want to get back to that IR because I'm just going to assume they don't know the answer. So now I'm going to start bothering the, bothering the C-suite. I'm going to start bothering the CFO if I want information. And that's not good use of the CFO's time. So we're really making sure that, that companies are investing in their IO um, capacity and that you are you know, all as well trained and as, uh, as knowledgeable as you can be. Um, I think it's one of the very critical things. Um, we've talked a little bit, and, and Harold also mentioned, you know, using management's time efficiently. You know, planning a calendar at the beginning of the year around trips. 
and uh, making sure that they can anchor you know, other business activities around when you're going to need them in New York or Paris or London or Singapore. You know, it's very important. And you know, this again goes to the point about you know, if, you, if you understand what investor group you're looking for, the calendar becomes terribly easy and declutters itself. It's when you're not sure and you don't have a strategy that, you know, and you get bombarded with invitations to speak at conferences and go to this and investor meetings. If you don't have a clear idea of how to how to prioritize and sort that through, then it is very confusing and you spend a lot of time. But if you know what you're doing, it is very easy. That is not relevant, that is not relevant, that, you know. It's not that they're not good, it's just that it's not for you at this time. So using management's time and Darius your own time is, uh, well, is, is, is one of the big benefits of doing best targeting. Um, and the format of the meetings, so, you know, depending on fund size, you know, it's either the sort of you know, one-on-one meetings may be appropriate or group meetings. I mean, as a rule of thumb, what we say is that, you know, for investors with you know, assets under management, you know, sort of above a billion US, then we generally do one-on-ones, and actually for people less than that, group meetings are fine. And, um, you know, dealing with hedge funds, again, you know, you need to have a strategy around whether you want to deal with hedge funds or not, and, and, and that is something which you, you need to develop, develop um, in, you know, in, internally, whether you want to exclude them completely or whether you feel that they have a role in terms of providing liquidity and, and raising the profile of, of, your, of your business. So, um, you know, approach that would, like, would largely depend on, on your status. Platforms, um, you know, the value of the non deal ratio, you know, the, the, there's two, you know, the, the conferences and non deal ratios. You know, non deal ratios, I think Harold was talking about, you know, carrying on and going around and keeping on meeting the same people. I mean, there is a huge benefit when you know the shareholders that you want to target and build your relationships with them, right? I mean, if we want long term relationships with people, these are just people. You know, we build relationships, you invest time, you invest energy. And again, you know, if you've targeted the right people and you know they're the right people, that is not a waste of time. It is only a waste of time if you're in the scattergun and you don't know what you're doing and you keep on seeing the same people and wondering why they're not investing and you haven't kind of figured out that it's because you know, they are not really in your, in your top universe. That, that it's a waste of time. But so building trust and goodwill, and this is a bit about the consistency, you know, being consistent. Um, and what that does, you know, that's not going to insulate you, know, you when there is bad news. It's not going to mean that they're all going to keep their stock if, you know, if the company goes through a really difficult time. But it does mean that they're likely to give you some sort of audience and they are going to understand and listen if, they, if you build those relationships. Um, conferences, you know, likewise, you know, they're easy one-stop shops. Um, there are too many of them, in my view, right now. I think that there are you know, too many being organized and not enough sort of analysis being done on how productive they all are. Um, but I do think that conferences have their, have their place and um, you know, can be, you know, can be a sort of easy, easy venue and can give you a very good platform in terms of thought leadership more generally um, for your business and for your management team. You know, assuming that they are you know, of the right level and have convened a high level of, of, um, of, uh, of, of, of attendees. So my advice here is really to, to choose very carefully and strategically. And as I said, if you've looked at your current and you understand where you're going, the choices become very easy. I have talked a little bit about media relations and, and, and I want to you know, just, just pause briefly here because I think that one of the things is that investor relations teams tend to think that media is somebody else's job, you know, that it's the corporate communications role and, and, and that's not my view. I think that um, media is, is an important stakeholder group for investor relations and for companies wanting to communicate on a capital markets agenda. The media is challenging and complex today, um, and securing the attention of the media is, 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 is a challenge, in the same way as it's a challenge to secure attention of, of, your, of, the, of the buyer side. But 
the value of it is, is that it enables, it enables you know, their, their up all day, up all night form, the international their global. If you can get their attention, you get a fantastic opportunity to access and, and tell your story to a very, very broad set of, of uh, stakeholders um, generally. And what we encourage our companies to do is to try and you know, build their newsletter around financial calendar as well as their financial calendar activities, obviously, um, to make sure that there is some real thought leadership and some really differentiated position. You know, the media is your friend if you use it correctly. Um, and an important part of using it correctly is in the same way as you roll with your buy side is to develop the relationships. So, again, okay, often with uh, clients that we work with, while the management team is in London, or while the management team is in New York, we will organise for them to do off the record background briefings so that they build relationships with the New York Times or the, F- the Financial Times or whoever it may be. Um, and, uh, and start, start building those relationships so that when we do have something that we want to go on the record with, that we already have a, a, an audience or relationship on which to build that. And uh, that is, can be extremely useful, um, what we have found. Um, it's an example of some media in, the, in, in Thailand. You know, all of these are reputable and important people. And I, think, and I think the wires are particularly interesting because the wires uh, can really set, set a tone um, and break the financial news. You know, they are normally the first people to write in the results and making sure that you have engaged with them to make sure that the tone of their article is right is important because it sets the tone for the rest of the, the, rest of the coverage. And there's a lot, you know, a lot of the stories are syndicated straight from there. So in summary, what do we say? We said that there is, a, there, is an, there, is a, there is an important need to understand who your investing universe is. You know, understand the role of the banks, you know, their strengths and their weaknesses. You know, understand that valuation is what drives investment, um, and there's no getting around that. Um, and that you know, understanding the institutions to whom you are spending, you know, targeting is, is key. We've talked about the different methods of targeting investors, qualitative, quantitative, we've talked about brokers and corporate access, making efficient use of your time and the management's time, and how important your role as investor relations professionals is in terms of you know, ensuring that the company is credible and, uh, and, and maintains its integrity and, and reputation with the buy-side community. And we've talked about the importance of media relations. Um, you know, building the case, building relationships, and there's a real platform to showcase you know, business strategy and achievements um, as you move forward so that you stay top of mind and top of the agenda in a competitive environment. And there we are. I don't have any time. So um, I'm happy to take any questions if, if you have any. I also recognize that it is Friday afternoon, so I will not be offended if I don't have any questions. How many media relations you mentioned earlier? Are there now many companies using Facebook and Twitter to communicate with their investor in the West? Um, there are lots of lots of companies using both those platforms. Um, there has been a much slower uptake of people using Twitter for their financial calendar investor relations material than there has in the West. In the West, and the SEC has approved it as a means of, of um, disseminating financial information. What we tend to find is that uh, companies in, in Asia have been slower to adopt that uh, generally, um, but it is certainly a trend that we are watching, and I certainly believe that it's a platform which will, which will only gain importance. I think Facebook not so much for financial information. I think people use Facebook more for brand and some corporate communications rather than financial communications, but Twitter certainly is a platform that is only going to grow in, in my view. Is there any concerns for us to consider if we want to communicate via uh, via Twitter? Just not to leak the news like Twitter did last week. Uh, so yeah, okay. 
Um, no, no, I, no, I, no, I mean, I, I, this, I, 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 I think, think that what, what, what if, if, if you're going to, if you're going to start using credit, I think that it's, it's, it's an interesting platform to use, you know, running it in parallel with, you know, your credential and things. I don't think that switching straight to Twitter and, and, and stopping the other ways that you have been used to, investors have been used to getting your results is, is the right way of doing it. I think building up the Twitter following is, is the first thing, and that, that takes time. Um, again, we've seen, a, we've seen more reluctance on the behalf of, of Asian um, companies to really um, engage on Twitter, so there, are, there is not a very high uptake or very high activity at the corporate level um, of Twitter. And there are very, very few CEOs, for instance, using Twitter um, in the Asian context, and in Singapore, just one, for instance. Um, so I think you know, the important thing is to make sure that you are building your Twitter presence and building your Twitter following, and, and then to ensure that you, know, you are starting to incorporate that as one of the platforms that you are disseminating your financial results to. And then we will all see, we will all get together and find out how that, how that platform develops. But my personal view is I think that it will develop in strength. Could you give us some, some names of the companies that have been successful in the recent year? Um, most of them are not Asian. There are very few Asian companies that have been using Twitter you know, as a primary source. I, mean, I think, Captain, do you use Twitter for your, your results or not yet? Um, it's one of the... Um, um, but, but mainly it's, 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 it's companies in, in the US and some of the UK companies um, who are using it. But in Asia, very few okay. is, is the short answer. Um, to try to talk about this uh, media, because for communication in Thailand, uh, in terms of the results, uh, sometimes we, on a quarterly basis, we do it on the official day. Do, have you heard about in the stock exchange of Thailand there is an opportunity day? It's an opportunity day. 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 Yes. No, I'm not, I'm not familiar with that. No, because uh, I have a lot of questions from the investors in overseas. Because for our company, we are starting to grow a lot of overseas investors. Yes. So they are very interested to look at our result on a quarterly basis. Yes. So, uh, as the ETH actually has created this opportunity day for a quarterly basis, but uh, the question is that it is all in Thai and it's not in English. So, sometimes the investor requesting us to speak in English. So, we tell them that this is one of the apps, same as Twitter, when they announce the results. It's one of the good practices, which I think is very good and excellent. So what, what do you feel about this kind of uh, practice? Is it appropriate to have it like, more globally in English? For the sort of change of time. I mean, in, in terms of, do they, do they actually push it for more in uh, English? Because they have it globally everywhere they can see the web class. Because they have so much experience. For to build a global investor base, we need to have this strong base in Thailand, right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I, mean, I should probably let, I don't want to, I think my host should probably answer that themselves, whether you feel that you should be. Actually, there are some companies that uh, give their representation in English. Uh, I think AH also do it in English, and PSL uh, also do it in English. I want that. Oh, okay, as well. Okay, okay. do it. First, first, the stock exchange plan, we intend to help, we are interested to have a chance to have direct contact with the company, so that's why not only we do it in time, but it's up to the company to choose the, the choice of you know, language. I certainly think for companies who are looking to you know, expand their international shareholder base, you know, it is very important to have your announcements in English. Um, it is unfortunately that you know, whether we like it or not, it is international language business. Um, and it would be a real impediment to uh, those investors not to be able to see the results at the same time as, um, or, you know, in a language which they understand as, as the local investors. So I think that companies, any companies who have got um, international shareholders or have ambitions to increase their international shareholding base, you must be able to provide information in English. Is there any more question? 
Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank